Hey there, and welcome to the Home Church YouTube channel. My name's Kenny, and I'm the lead pastor right here at Home Church based out of Denver, North Carolina. We're excited that you chose to join us for today's message, and I believe that God is gonna use today's word to challenge and encourage you in your walk with Jesus. But listen, wherever you're watching from all across this world, we invite you to join us by subscribing to this channel so that you get the freshest content that we produce every single week. But also, if you'd like to partner with this ministry, we'd invite you to do that as well. Visit our website at myhomechurch.cc backslash give to partner with us. We pray that God uses this message to challenge you today and to bless you as you hear the teaching of God's word. So we've been uh, in a series uh, called Asking for a Friend. And uh, if you're joining us online, uh, my name is Kenny. I serve as the lead pastor here at Home Church. And so we're in a series called Asking for a Friend. And the first two weeks, we've been having questions sent in, and I've been answering a few of those. And uh, today, we are going to do a live Q&A session, which is uh, terribly nerve-wracking for me. <laughs> and so uh, pray for me. Um, and so what we're going to do is if you have a question and you're live in the audience, today's your day. Uh, and so what you'll be able to do is, uh, Grayson is down here. Grayson's our worship leader. Stand up so they can see your beautiful face. As if they didn't just see you. Are you on? I hope so. There hey, it is. Just taking a little break. I'm a yeah, little, yeah. So Grayson's down here. So if you have a question, you can make your way down here to Grayson. And uh, we've got some seats down here. We're going to put you on a microphone. And uh, by the way, we need your participation because this is going to like not go real well if you don't Absolutely. come up here and ask any questions. Um, we did have a few that were texted in that, for whatever reason, uh, we didn't get a chance to get to already. So uh, we're, we're definitely going to hit some of those kind of along the way. But if you have a question and you're in-house, I want to just go ahead and invite you. You can start making your way uh, down here to Grayson, and we're going to get those. If you're new today, uh, here's the whole idea. Um, there are many times that we have questions that, uh, about church, about God, about Scripture, about life that sometimes we're nervous to ask or uh, we never really been given the space or the place to ask it. And so that's what we've been wanting to do during this whole series. Uh, many of us have questions. And, uh, and so what we want to do is just help you uh, in that. And so that's the heart of this. So yeah. um, I don't know. So if you got a question, go ahead and start making your way. I see somebody working their way down. We got a few others. Yeah, so. if you have a question, go ahead and line up this way. So you want to line right here. We got a little X right here um, that you're going to stand on. One rule, don't touch my mic, okay? Stays on the stand. If I need to lower it, I will. Don't touch the mic because you know what happens when people get mics. They, they just want to talk forever. People and then we're crazy. doing a TED Talk. And it's just, it's wild. Right. Yeah. All right. So uh, we got some in the house or already? All right. Come on. Let's we're ready. See what you got. Let's First see. one up. Okay. In the mic, I want you to tell me what's your name, what's your grade, what's your favorite <laughs> color? No. Okay. What's your name and um, how long you've been attending home church? Uh, well, good morning. My name is Mark O'Leary. I'm Hi, an elder Mark. here. Hi there. <laughs> I'm an elder here at Home Church, and I've been here from the beginning. Awesome. Amen. Uh, so, Pastor Kenny, as you know, uh, as I continue my Christian walk, um, I go to Bible studies. I participate in them. I help lead them. And so I do, you know, Bible studies are important in my growth. And currently in the men's group, we're actually studying the Bible. Yep. And we've learned a lot. And one of the interesting things that jumped out at me is, we, uh, we know that there are 66 books in the Bible, but we've learned that there are different versions of the Bible, not just in the type of interpretations or learning guides and things like that, but sure. the, um, in, in the Greek Orthodox Bible in the Old Testament, they have 39 books compared to 27. The Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Bible, they have uh, 37 books. So, and I believe that's referred to as the Apocrypha. So my question is, how do we reconcile it that our, our Bible of reference has less and theirs has more? Yep. And then in this, I actually kind of am asking for a friend or referencing a friend. I know of close friends of mine who have gotten into conflicts with their church leadership. And simply put it, they say, well, that's not biblical. Because in their perspective, it's not biblical, but these churches, they do that. And sometimes you hear, well, this is just the way our church does it. Sure. And yeah. they, they resign themselves that that's okay. Yeah. And yet we're, we're not... So how, how do we navigate that sure. when those awkward discussions come up? Good, good. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so, okay, there's, that is a lot to unpack. <laughs> good okay. luck. So in, in essence, the question is, like, I, the way I, I see it is, like, how do we know the Scripture, like this right here, that I carry, that I teach from, how do, how do we know that it's 
credible. Is that a fair way? Is that, is that fair? And, and because there are lots of uh, traditions, uh, there are lots of other books, um, other religions have, who call themselves Christians have other books. I'll give you a great, for instance, um, Mormons uh, who call themselves Christians, who I'll just lovingly say this, they are not. They, they do not believe in the same Jesus we believe in. They believe in a created Jesus, uh, and Jesus was not created. Jesus has been part of the Godhead from the very beginning. Uh, they have a book of Mormon that they use as scripture. Um, uh, our, our Catholic friends have uh, like the Apocrypha and, and other books, and, and so Greek Orthodox as well. So lots of traditions carry lots of different things. But for, for us, here's kind of how uh, I, I'll answer this, Mark, and I'll try to be brief. Um, there are a couple of things that I hold to when it comes to Scripture, right? Um, and a lot of it is around church tradition, okay? Um, so in, uh, in, in the 300s, uh, around AD 3, 325, uh, there was a leader named Constantine who uh, basically turned Rome into a Christian nation. Uh, and around that time, he actually pulled together scholars, biblical scholars from all over the world, and brought together a council called the Council of Nicaea. This was around uh, AD 325. And this was a council where they took all of these different writings. Because at the end of the day, that's, that's what these are. In, in the Bible, we have a collection of writings from authors who were either, either writing history, they were writing uh, sayings, they were writing wisdom, they were writing uh, narrative accounts. And so at this council, they took all of these writings and they took them and they read them and they understood them. And ultimately, they decided what we call the canon of Scripture at that time, where they put the canon of Scripture in order that they believed were inspired, that, that, that ultimately they believed also would be held as the inerrant, infallible Word of God. And so they created the canon of Scripture that we hold to today, the 66 books of the Bible written by 40 plus or minus uh, one author with Hebrews, we're not real sure. Um, and so, uh, listen, and, and these are written in three different languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, written over 1,700 years uh, in their scope from the first writing to the final writing that we have, uh, and written over three continents, Right? So pulling all this together, the Council of Nicaea pulls all this together, and ultimately they, they decide on these 66 books. Uh, they omitted some writings, probably good. There are some out there right now. You can go and read the, the uh, Book of Enoch. Prob not a bad read, but we don't consider it a part of the Holy Scriptures. Uh, there are Gospels out there that uh, talk about the Gospel of Jesus' early days um, did not fall into the canon of Scripture. And so what we hold to is that from the Council of Nicaea, uh, these men, based on church tradition, interpretation, and the power of the Holy Spirit, pulled together a canon uh, that we now hold to as the Word of God. Um, and so ultimately, that's, that's what we follow. Two years later, they got together again, and they're like, yo, did we make any mistakes? Like, like we said all this, but like, this is a pretty big deal. And they came back together, and they unanimously agreed that this canon would be the canon that we would hold to as, again, what we call the inerrant, meaning without error, from, from, from beginning to the maps, <laughs> infallible, meaning there is, no, like, there is no wrong in it, it does not contradict itself, word of God. And so we believe that these writings are inspired by the, by, by the Holy Spirit, and we take them as holy inspired scriptures. And so when we say the word of God, that's what we hold to. We believe that every word in here is meant and inspired by the Holy Spirit, by God our Father, for us to consume as his word to us. So, I don't know if that's helpful, Mark, but that's how we'll, yeah. Good? All right. Answer your question? Awesome. Thank you, Pastor. Um, I'm going to throw some questions we had texted in uh, to you before we yep. get to our next All live right. one. Cool. All right, so here's a question. Yep. Um, so, I'm new to reading my Bible and don't know where to start. Do I start in Matthew? Do I start in Genesis? What do you recommend? Yeah, I love that question. So first of all, at Home Church, we want everyone to have an everyday relationship with Jesus, meaning we want to encourage you to spend time in God's word and to pray every day. Even if it's just for a minute or two, like we want to create a discipling program where everyone spends some time with Jesus every day. And so I'll tell you quickly, I was on a church staff for six years 
And, uh, and so for part of that, at the very end, I got to a place where I was reading my Bible and it was actually, it was a chore. Like I was reading it so I wouldn't get fired. Yo, that's, that ain't good. That ain't good. I took about six months where I actually did not read God's word. I'm not saying that because I'm proud of it. Um, but because it, God used that time to actually take me back to the very beginning and so here's what I would tell you. This is, listen, this is just my opinion. You don't have to do this, but this is the way God worked in my life. Um, and it started with, I, I was uh, writing, I was listening to a podcast, and I heard uh, this part of scripture in Matthew where it was talking about Jesus as a rabbi. Anyone ever heard that Jesus was a rabbi? I, I read that and I'm like, okay, I think I have a little bit of an understanding of what a rabbi is, but I don't really get it. So I did some research. Well, what is a rabbi? A rabbi in a Jewish tradition was a teacher, and they would have disciples, otherwise known as Talmud, and these disciples would leave their life and follow their rabbi and follow him wherever he went to learn whatever he would teach. And so now I have this different understanding of Jesus and the way that he walked this life and these disciples, and honestly, it sent me running backwards in my scripture. Because to understand Jesus, you got to understand, first and foremost, our Savior was Jewish. I know a lot of people are like, uh, wait, what? We're, we're Christians. Yeah, yeah. Jesus wasn't a Christian. Jesus was Christ. Jesus was Jewish. And so for us to really understand Jesus Christ, we actually have to understand and, and the, the way of life of our Jewish brothers and sisters. So I literally decided to go all the way back to the beginning of Genesis. And in doing so, there are three things that I started reading Scripture over with that have helped me really take and understand Scripture in a whole new way. And I want to encourage you to do this. Number one is this. Who is the author? Right? So if you start at the very beginning, you start with Genesis, the author is Moses. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Okay? So who, who's the author? Who are they writing to? And what's some of the historical context that's happening in the time that that author is writing to those to that audience? What is he trying to communicate? And all of a sudden, when you start to learn those things, and then you start to read Scripture, and by the way, when I say read Scripture, I mean take your time and read it for comprehension. You know how we got any English teachers in the room? We got a few, right? So you're right. So your English teacher would always say, "Don't don't don't just read to read. Read for comprehension." In Scripture, we do this thing often where I call it the lullaby effect, where we just read it because we probably heard it, and we just like skim right over it, but we actually don't take time to consume it and comprehend it. And so if you were to take the time to remember and study who the author is, who's the author writing to, what's the historical context around this writing, and if you take your time and actually read to comprehend what the Word is teaching you, you will be shocked at how God will reveal himself to you in mighty and powerful ways. And that's been the journey that I went on. I literally went back and started over. And so for me, Scripture, uh, it starts in Genesis. Uh, and Scripture for us ends in Revelation. And so if you're going to start somewhere, why not start at the beginning and understand who our God is? Start there. Wrap your head around who our God is. What did he create? Why did he create it? How does he love us? Why does he love us? Right? And then you start walking through the narrative of his people and their journey and the way he's related to them, the way he's spoken to them, and then ultimately the gift of Jesus, his one and only son that he sent us, and then the life from Jesus to his disciples and then into the church, and ultimately Paul writing the epistles to the churches in Galatia, Rome, Philippi, Ephesus, and then John and Peter writing their letters, and then ultimately ending with John the Revelator writing Revelation you're going to gain a whole new understanding of what these words are trying to teach you. And I think it will be helpful. So, That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Sure. You don't have to All clap. Right. It's okay. Next question. Who we got live Q&A? I know name. her. I do too. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> She's short. <laughs> Boom. Thank, thank you. Hi, my name is Maddie Phillips. Hi. Um, uh, my question is, what is our prayer life supposed to look like with our spouse? Um, as a young married couple, we're still trying to navigate that and figure out um, what part of our spirituality is supposed to be kept individual and then what we're supposed to join together. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. So, um, confession time. 
Um, man, this is an area I've really struggled with in my life. Super real. You know that. Um, so uh, for the first multiple years of my marriage, my wife actually led me. Um, emotionally, uh, financially, spiritually, like she, le- she led uh, she would pray, I wouldn't. She would give, I wouldn't. She would go to church, I wouldn't. Like, like she led. And um, ultimately, God did a, a really a, a changing work in my heart where I realized, like, that ain't the way. And I'll just straight up tell you that this is one of the hardest things that I've had to, like, navigate. Because here's what's really weird, and it's hard to explain. But if anyone were to walk up to me at any point, I would have no problem praying for you. Like, No problem. Uh, easy, glad to pray for you. And yet, for whatever reason, it's still weird and awkward to sit and to pray with my wife. Just being real with you, it just is. I don't really have a full explanation as to why that is. I think part of it is because that wasn't the way that we started, and so it was really hard to get over. And so I wanna, I wanna just take a second and speak to the men in the room. Uh, can I just, men, can I just tell you, I know it's weird. Like, it's, it's awkward, and you're like, yo, like, what do I say? What do I pray? Like, I haven't been doing this. Like, how do I start without it being weird and feeling like I got coerced into this thing? Like, I just want to encourage you this. Um, I, I just want to acknowledge it is hard, and it is a difficult thing to start. But I also want to challenge you in this is that you've been given a God-appointed opportunity and responsibility to lead your wife. And the first place that it is going to show up is not in how much money you make, not in how well you take care of the kids and the car and the house and the bills, but in how well you love her and equally submit to spiritually lead her. And I'm just going to straight up tell you, men, it is hard, especially if you haven't been doing it. It is a discipline that we have to create in our lives to submit to God, to be willing to walk through the awkward moments of holding our wife's hand and praying with and for her and with and for our children and our families. And so what does it look like? I think that we all need individual prayer time for sure. Scripture tells us that to find a secret place, a quiet place, and some people have a closet, some people have a room, some people have an office, whatever that might be. I want to encourage you to find a secret place where you can go after and cry out to God and pray and share with him. Uh, a lot of people way over-spiritualize prayer. It's real, it really is fairly simple. It's just you having dialogue with God. That's it. He just, he just wants to talk to you. He just wants to hear what you have to say. Even though he already knows it, he wants you to tell him. Because like a good father, I I do this with my children. I know where my kids want to go to lunch. They want to go to Chick-fil-A. I already know that. But you know what? I ask them anyways, hey, what do you want for lunch today? Hey, Daddy, I want to go to Chick-fil-A. And I want a chicken burger and I want a Sprite. (laughs) Cool, man. Like, hey, let's do that. Let's go to Chick-fil-A today. Or... Hey, guys, what do you want to do? Chick-fil-A? Yeah, we're not going there today. <laughs> so I got news for you. Sometimes he's going to bless you, and you're going to get Christian chicken and a Sprite. Sometimes he'd be like, nah, we're going somewhere and getting a salad. Um, but I want to encourage you to lean into prayer. That, that, God will meet you there. Uh, the second part that I want to say about this is I do believe it is important that we find ways and times to pray together. There, there is, a, there is a, a bonding. First and foremost, when you get married, Scripture tells us that the two shall become what? One. Okay? So in that, we also have to come together to pray over our families, over our marriage, over our children, over our finances, over all those things. And another thing that I'll tell you is this, is that I oftentimes meet families who are kind of torn. The husband believes one thing, wife believes another, and they're trying to figure out, like, what do we do? Here's what I want to encourage you. Um, Prayer is a really great way to submit your heart to God and submit your heart to one another. And when you do that, all of a sudden, I'm telling you, you're going to find yourself starting to agree even when you disagree. Your heart is going to start to bend to try to, like, find a way to work together. And then the last part of that is I've seen God do incredible things when we actually submit in that way to bend our heart where we can align and move forward. 
I have uh, young couples that I talk to all the time, and, and um, one will say, hey, I feel called to go do this. I'll say, what, is your, what does your spouse say? And usually it's a guy saying, hey, I feel called to do this, and I'll say, what's your wife say? And he'll say, well, she, I don't know, she's not on board. I said, for me, a calling is both and. If you're called to it, we're called to it. Uh, which is why, like, for us, like, th- this home church, like, this isn't a Kenny Mills thing. This is a Mills family thing. Like, but not just because I'm called to this, but because we are called to this. The only way we know that is that we've been on board, we've been praying, we submit to God, we submit to each other. He made it clear this is what's for us. So I'll encourage you in that. So, good question, Maddie. All right, we got a couple more. Awesome. Okay. Quickly. Next question. Come on up. You're a little taller than Maddie, so I'll just adjust it. Like that again? Yeah. Oh, no, go. that's not good. I really couldn't tell. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're good. There we go. Matt's talking out of the top of his head. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Um, so my name is Matthew Bell, by the way. Um, I've been here since, what, the second technically organized yep. home church? That's right. Gathering. So um, my question becomes, you know, the media plays such a prominent role in society at this point. And a lot of what you see in the media pertaining to church and Christianity has to do with corruption, particularly financial corruption. However, it would seem to me that while that's going on, it's certainly still leading some people to Jesus, maybe through a very not a good choice of leadership per se, but still they're getting there. How does, how does that communicate and how does that translate to the church? Gotcha. So are you asking about like, like pastors who fail? Are you asking about like uh, churches that are real big, pastors make lots of money? That w- yeah, there you okay. go. Yeah, like the giant ones. I'm yeah, not yeah. going to say names, but yeah. you know, they make, sure. you know, so-and-so has this gigantic mansion and all yeah. this money and, you know, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, um, unless someone is teaching falsely publicly, I will never stand in this pulpit and rebuke someone by name who I don't sit at a part of their house. Um, and so uh, I will not mention any, any names in any of this, but it's clear like we have, uh, there's a couple of things that happen in, in church culture in America. Uh, one is that the enemy is at play and wants to destroy the church. <laughs> Um, and so uh, anything that could be said negatively about the church, you're going to hear about it because the enemy is after the church. Now, does that mean that there aren't bad things happening? For sure. There, there are terrible things happening inside of churches uh, in lots of places, and I hate that. Um, one is, is, is corruption, and part of that oftentimes is either around abuse or it is around financial things. And so, uh, man, I don't know. I, I can't speak to how other churches do things. I can just speak to, like, what we do. Um, and so for us, I mean, we have good, healthy accountability around me and us. Uh, you met Mark, one of our elders. We have four other elders who are uh, all, they're all in the room, actually. Uh, Travis, Shane, Tyler, Mark. Uh, they serve as uh, lay elders of our church. They're a part of this house, literally. Them and their families are all sitting here right now. We also have overseers who are actually outside of our church who provide oversight and leadership uh, to me and to us. Um, And then so they offer uh, audits and reviews and all that stuff. They can fire me. So if I do something real dumb or uh, fall or whatever, I need to be removed, like they can do that. Uh, This isn't the Kenny Mills show. This is is home church. Um, And so we have some accountability around that. And then lastly, around finances, we, we have accountability as well. We're a young church and uh, as you start a church, it's hard for, because usually the pastor's doing everything. Like, and I did for a while. I, I did everything. I would come up here and preach, and then we'd go back there, we'd collect the money, I'd take it, and I'd input it, I'd take it to the bank and all that stuff. We're really working hard to separate uh, really any of our staff away from any finances aside from digital abilities that can be tracked. Uh, we don't deal in cash like that stuff. We take it you know, to the bank or whatever. But we also, we have financial reporting that we do monthly um, amongst our el- uh, elders. Uh, we're actually are going to meet today as our elders and we'll have a quarterly report. Uh, we also provide an annual report to the church financially of what we've done, what we've seen, what we've brought in, what we've spent out. Um, and we'll continue to be as transparent uh, with that as we can. Um, there is just to speak about pastors who drive real nice cars, have big houses. Um, 
So in my early days, I would have told you this. The only thing keeping me from a million-dollar house was a million dollars. <laughs> right? I, like, can we be real? Like, um, and then along the way, I, I've learned two things that have um, humbled me in that and given me some wisdom. Uh, one is this, is that as a leader, I'm learning that the way not only I talk, the things that I say, but how I live my life, people will see it and they will hold to me to account to it. Uh, straight up, that sucks in some ways because like, I'd like to just I'll give you a for instance. My house sits on a corner lot that everybody drives by. They can. It's like a fishbowl. And I have to make sure my grass gets cut every week so somebody doesn't drive by and be like, see that dude? I mean, can't even cut his grass. What the heck, you know? Like, I don't like that, but I'd like to be like you. I'd like to let my grass go for two weeks and get knee high every now and then. And, um, you know, uh, it, there's, there's a way in which we live that we want to be, uh, as Scripture says, um, we want to be above reproach. And so in that way, we try to live our lives humbly. Uh, we want to steward well what God puts in our hands. Um, and so we try to live in that way. Um, the, the finances to our church for someone who wants to sit and open it up and have a conversation, a legitimate conversation, um, we're open to have that conversation. Um, the only thing that you will not find out is how much I make. And here's why. Um, because there is nothing that will separate me and you more than you knowing how much I make. Here's why. Because either if for some crazy reason I actually make more money than you, you will hold it against me. And in the case, which is more likely true, that you make more money than I do, you think I will hold it against you. And I don't want either of those things to be true. And so here's what I'll tell you. Uh, I'm the sole provider for my household. Uh, I make a livable wage. We pay our bills. Katie and I are out of debt. Uh, I drive a 2011 Ford uh, Explorer. My wife drives a van that my mama gave us. Um, and so the, the reality is, is that we try to live our life in a way that you can, with integrity, and I can stand here and say, follow me as I follow Jesus. I want to try to live my life in a way. Now, I'm going to mess it up for sure. I'm going to say dumb things. If you've been around, you know, I'm going to say dumb things. There are going to be times I do dumb things. I am not perfect. If you are looking for a pastor and a church who's perfect, has it all figured out, will never fail, there's the door. It, it, this ain't it. This ain't it. But by the Spirit of the God and by our best ability to walk in integrity, we're going to do it as best we know how. And if you have questions, we're open. We want to talk. We want to open up whatever you need to see because we want you to be able to trust that you can follow our leadership as well. And I say our. And I said this. I, I had a meeting with one of our elders the other day, and he, he, we were joking, and, and he slipped up, and he was like, your church. I was like, nah, dude, this ain't my church. First of all, it's our church. Secondly, it's not even our church. It's Jesus' church. And so if any of y'all ever say, your church, I'm going to rebuke you. <laughs> I'm going to correct you. It ain't my church. God just called me to steward it as the lead pastor. So, awesome. All right, I think we got like maybe time for one quick one. One quick one. All right, you got a question? This again. Right there. Right. Hello, my name is Kaylin O'Leary. I'm the daughter of Tara and Mark O'Leary, and I've been going here consistently for five months now. Cool. My question is, I am a very visual learner, and I want to understand the Bible and the historical importance of the Bible, and I'm curious if there is any theological reasoning behind Jesus being portrayed as white, and if you know any resources where I can actually view a accurate representation of what happens in the Bible. Sure. Great question. Uh, let me say this. Jesus is not white. <laughs> so Jesus is a Hebrew boy who was raised in Jerusalem and, 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 and Nazareth. I mean, spent some time in Egypt. You ever met somebody who lived in that area who was white like me? No. So the portrayal of Jesus being white is, uh, it is, oh boy, I want to be careful here. It's a, it's a European thing in some ways. Um, honestly, it's, 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 it comes a lot from the Catholic Church. Um, and so there's this portrayal that Jesus is white because I don't know, I don't know why they did that, but they <laughs> portrayed him as white. But the reality is Jesus is not white. 
Uh, I think we're going to be shocked when we actually see Jesus face to face at how dark that dude's going to be. Um, <laughs> which is part of why, like, um, I struggle that there's still a lot of racism in the church. <laughs> like, it blows my mind that we have people inside of the church who claim to be a follower of Jesus, submit to his lordship, and take his salvation for their own, and still have problems with people of color. Are you insane? Like, are you crazy? I, you know, and some of you guys know my story. I was raised up in a racist house. And for many years of my life, I was racist because that's what I was taught. And man, like God done a mighty work in my life because he brought people of color into my life who helped me open my eyes and realize just how foolish I was being. And then along the way, like to your point, Kaylin, I've learned like, yo, our savior was Jewish. He was living in the Middle East and he was for sure a dark brother. And so like, I, I, I just, it's something that I struggle with. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna come off the racism piece. Cause I don't, and I'm not, that's not a political statement either. Like, that's, that's just a heart problem, <laughs> okay? Um, but in that, where are some, where are some good resources? So uh, I think anything that you go and you can find, again, I, 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 I'm telling you, our Jewish brothers and sisters have a lot that we can learn from. Uh, now, listen, they don't believe in Jesus, so we gotta, there's a separation piece there. But I think if you want to start, I think that that is a good place, especially Messianic Jewish uh, brothers and sisters. These are people who are uh, Hebrew and Jewish by birth and, and nationality, but they are people who actually believe Jesus is and was the Messiah. I think those are great resources to look at. You're going to find way more accurate understandings of who Jesus was, who Jesus is, what he looked like, how his life went. Yep. All right. Any others that we need to just hit quickly? Um, any other live questions? There if was I gotta... one that got texted in I do want to hit. Yeah. Uh, it's the mental health one. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Um, it's the mental health one. What, what's that question? Here we go. Um, mental health is a very large issue in today's society. What does Jesus say about anxiety and depression? Yeah. Is it against God's will to be medicated for such ailments? Yeah, that was a good question. We actually got several of those, and that's I, I wanted to hit on that real quick. So um, you don't have to raise your hand. But if you've struggled or are struggling with depression, anxiety, worry, all that kind of stuff, you, again, you don't have to raise your hand. Like, in your own heart, would you raise your hand? Like, would you acknowledge that you've probably, many of us have carried pieces like that? I think many of us have. Um, and so there is this um, misnomer in the church where um, people want to run away from anything medical anything um, prescribed, things like that. Um, And I just want to tell you, there is a healthy balance in the way that we care for ourselves. First and foremost, Jesus says that all those who are heavy and burdened bring that to him, lay it at his feet. He says that his yoke is easy, his burden is light. So if you're carrying burdens and anxiety and stresses and things like that, the first place we have to go is to Jesus. We do. We have to submit those things to him. We have to trust him in those things. It also is a question of faith. Oftentimes, when we struggle in anxiety and worry, it's because we carry things, responsibility, we think that we can control it. And oftentimes, we can't control them. And so there's a lack of faith in us at times. And so take it to Jesus. Secondly, ask him to encourage and build up your faith so that you can trust him in the things that, you're struggling with and that you feel like you've lost control in. The the second part of this is I wanna say that uh, we actually have a gospel written by a physician. His name is Luke. (laughs) And so I I wanna tell you this. I think that there are times that that God will give us the ability to see miracles and healing and things like that. Um, But there are times that God has gifted us with wisdom, with science, with technology, and with medication to help us. I think the question is, are we dependent on it? Because it becomes a question of, am I dependent on Jesus or am I dependent on these other things? Now, do you need them? For sure. I know people that need medication for diabetes. I know people that need medication for heart issues. I I know people that need medication for lots of things. 
But it has to come back to our heart. What are we dependent on? And in, a lot of times in mental health, there's a balance. The last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say about this is uh, it's about seeking and taking help. Um, you ever heard the story uh, of the guy who was in a flood and he's on the top of the roof and he's like crying out, God, send me help. Send him, like, come on, God, I need you to show up. And like, there's a little boat that putters by and they're like, come on, man, get in. He's like, no, 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 I'm waiting on God to show up and, and save me. And, and, and then there's like a bigger boat that comes by and they're like, come on. He's like throwing a life vest over and he's like, no, I'm waiting on God to save me. And then a helicopter comes by and drops a guy down and he's like, hop on, man, I'm going to save you. And he's like, no, I'm waiting on God to show up. And then the floods come and the guy dies and he shows up in heaven. He's like, God, what happened? I thought you were going to save me. He's like, yo, I sent you two boats and a helicopter, my man. Like, I think in a lot of ways that this, this, is, we ha- this happens in our life. We for sure need to be dependent on God, but God also gives us people in our life who care for us, want to walk with us, minister to us, support us, encourage us. Yo, drop your pride and let people help you. The, the, the next part of that is that uh, we actually sometimes have to submit to help. Oftentimes, the help is actually God sending it to you. And I think for some folks, the form of prescriptions and doctor's advice and medication is a way that he can provide the help that sometimes you need. I'll encourage you to lean on him, trust the spirit. Your dependency would stay with him and not on your medication. Uh, I saw something just this morning. Uh, anybody know who Simon Sinek is? Anybody? Yeah. So he's uh, uh, like a motivational speaker and that kind of thing. He said something that I had really, I really enjoyed. He said, uh, uh, we need to change the conversation from mental health to mental fitness. And he talked about this idea that when we talk about mental health, it's always because it's bad. <laughs> But he says when we think about fitness, we're not necessarily, we know all of us need to get better and grow in our fitness. He said, what if we were to take the idea of mental fitness to grow in our, as our fit, physically fit in our mentality rather than always being worried about how poor we are in our mental health? And I, I thought that was a pretty cool little paradigm shift. And so here's what I'll just leave you with, and then we're going to go. It's 1130. So, um, I just want to encourage you in this. I think that that is a key piece, right, where we talked about dependence. And if I were to just give some wisdom to the church today, I think that dependence is the thing that we have lost in our walk with Jesus. Many of us have become dependent on money, jobs, cars, vacations, boats, all this lifestyle stuff, and many of us have lost our dependence on the presence of God in our life. And I just want to challenge you today as you walk out of here, what a beautiful day. We celebrated families. We prayed blessing over you and over some families. We answered some questions. I hope it was helpful to you, but I want you walking out of here today challenged by what does your dependence on God look like? Are you dependent on all these other things to bring you happiness and joy and satisfaction? Or can you rest in what God has for you, who he is, the gift of Jesus in your life, and be satisfied in that? Be dependent on that rather than finding joy in all these other things. I think that if you challenge yourself in that, I think it's going to really cause you to question how you spend some of your time, how you spend some of your money, how you... Uh, the things that you give your life to. Scripture says that where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So I'll leave you with this. Where's the treasure of your dependence? Where's the treasure of your time, your effort, your energy, your commitment, your involvement? Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And where your heart is, that's where your God is. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for... What a beautiful day at home, church, God. We won't forget it. Uh, God, I thank you for the ability to answer questions that I hope will help um, serve people well. God, this has been a fun series. You've met us here. And so, God, I thank you for uh, what a beautiful day that we got to celebrate families again. Father, we submit them to you. And, God, we look forward to what you're going to continue to do in and through uh, each of us.
God, we look forward to next week to celebrate mothers. It's going to be a beautiful day. And so, God, we thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, hey, we'll hope to see you guys back next Sunday for Mother's Day. It's going to be awesome. Uh, Photo booth, all kinds of great things. We'll see you then. Have a great day. Thank you for taking the time to enjoy this message from Home Church. We hope that God used today's message to encourage you and to challenge you as you heard the teaching of his word. Listen, if there's anything in today's message that spoke to you, or if you asked Jesus into your life today, let us know. We would love to celebrate with you. Simply send us an email at hello at myhomechurch.cc and let us know that you made that decision today. Also, if today's message uh, impacted your life, uh, you can take a step forward and a step into supporting the ministry of Home Church by giving online right now at myhomechurch.cc. Again, thank you for watching today's message. Make sure you like and subscribe so that you get all of the fresh content from Home Church.